Today's guest on the Kenyan Yoga Podcast is Doug Swenson. Doug, brother of David, first learned yoga from Ernest Wood, the British early Orientalist who happened for some reason to end up in Texas, where Doug was uh, grew up as a young boy in the early 60s. So from here, Doug never really looked back and learning yoga from Ernest and from the books that Ernest gave. He started pursuing a yoga uh, career really from, from, from his boyhood, an eclectic approach, moving to California when he was about 18 to surf. He immediately reconnected to the yoga and uh, started Ashtanga Yoga there. Discovering Ashtanga Yoga, he was the person to introduce David to Ashtanga, a brother five years younger, David that is. However, where David remains staunchly committed to Ashtanga Yoga, Doug has always been very, very much a free spirit, really um Really the, the epitome of a yogi, really, Doug. So it really comes across in this interview that Doug is this incredibly sweet, gentle, self-effacing, yogic, if I, you know, pardon my cliche character, really the picture of a true yogi and one who has never been tied down either to a place or dogmas. Rather, Doug really sees his place in nature. He's most at home in nature. And he tells many stories on this uh, episode in, about nature and his relationship with practicing in nature. And he finds himself and his belonging in nature. So Doug's teaching, more than anything of a style, a teacher or principal, are rooted in this appreciation of nature. And, well, I hope you enjoy meeting Doug as much as I did. Um, welcome, Doug, to the Keenan Yoga Podcast. So today's guest on Kino Yoga Podcast is Doug Swetson and really happy to have you, Doug. First time we've met, I believe. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. We've we've been a little bit back and forth on, on social media, but um first time to speak in person. Um obviously I've spoken to your brother before. Um do you want to tell me from your side how you got into yoga? How you know how you came into yoga and how you introduced David into yoga as well. Yeah, that's kind of uh, sort of something that happened, but I didn't plan on it. Uh, when I was really young, I was uh, 14, and uh, my parents belonged to a church group called Unitarian Fellowship. And uh, it's kind of a conglomeration of different religions. Anyway, uh, one man in the group, his name was Ernest Wood, and uh he had translated the Bhagavad Gita into English, and uh, he spent decades in India studying yoga. And so he and his wife opened up this uh, church called the School of the Woods. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so he was just one of the members in the group. My parents didn't even know what yoga was, but they said, oh, uh, you should meet Mr. Wood. And then he showed me, my dad gave me one of his books. And, and uh, so he used to teach some of the Sunday school kids yoga, uh, you know, a couple times a month. And uh, I didn't really know I was doing yoga because I was just a little kid, you know. And then uh, and then when I got to be uh, 17, Mr. Wood had passed away. And then I had gotten, I had a, uh, an interest in surfing. And so I went to, I was living in Texas at the time. So I went to Southern California to go surfing. And I was surfing at Swami's at the Self-Realization Fellowship there. And I saw some people on the lawn doing some of the stuff Mr. Wood taught me. I said, what is this? And they go, it's yoga. And I go, oh, I know all about yoga. But, you know, like, so that's how I got started. And then uh, David, I mean, we're, my brother and I are six years apart. So, you know, he was just like. I did that right. That young. Okay, right. I didn't so, realize. Such, yeah, so such when I cat. was right. 15, yeah. you know, he's still it's pretty young <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so anyway uh then uh i was a, a little bit later uh you know i had continued doing what mr wood had taught me i was just doing yoga out of his books and then uh i got that book uh yoga youth and reincarnation by jess stern i think it was 
and uh, that was my first official yoga book. So I was doing yoga out of the book, and then uh, uh, I saw a sign for a yoga teacher at a, you know, one of the colleges or something. So I started teaching a little yoga, and then and then I taught my brother yoga. Oh well, you you started teaching it at that point. Well, yeah, when I was really young, I think the first class I taught was like. 18 or something like that. I'm not sure. But, oh, today's my birth. Today's my birth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. I'm 71. So, that's but incredible. It, but if you flip it, I'm 17. So, <laughs> but it is kind of funny. Like, you know, as we get older in our head, we're still, you know, a little kid and living at home and your parents are feeding me and stuff. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's how I got into yoga and my, what what year was that? Wait, do you remember when you were sur- sur- surfing at the meet and you know? Oh, when I first roughly... went surfing, yeah, I was seventeen, yeah. so that would be nineteen sixty eight. Oh, that's just incredible! And uh, in um, Sanitas, California, and it was back then. Mm-hmm. It was just flower meadows on the bluff and just surfers, and that's the only place I'd ever been where there were other people doing yoga. Because in Texas, oh, that, that's just a lady. Well, I'll just finish it. Like in Texas, I didn't know anyone that did yoga except for. Ernest Wood, and then he passed away. And it's then, also, fa- I mean, that that name rings a bell. I think it's you know, it's quite a famous, um, yeah, he is. early tra- he translator good. of the Bhagavad Gita, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, yeah, he was British, but he, yeah, he was fascinated with philosophy and Indian culture. So he spent decades in India, and he used to teach uh, Sanskrit at the college in India. And then I'm not sure why he came to the U.S., but he and his wife, <laughs> but I'm glad that he came to Houston, Texas. You know, that was a, it's so conservative. And then as I got a little older and uh, taught my brother yoga, we would do yoga in the outside in the parks because it was a mild climate. And uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. only been thrown in jail once in my life, and it was for doing yoga in a park in Texas because people thought they saw somebody in the park doing strange things. And then uh, the police came and said, uh, and by then I was doing shavasana and I was wrapped up in a blanket. And then the police came and said, well, the neighbors complained that there was somebody doing something strange in the park behind the bushes and they were concerned. And I said, well, I've been here every day. I haven't seen anybody. <laughs> and then they took me to jail. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I got started. Where did you get, I mean, how did it get from Hatha Yoga and then what you were learning the book to Ashtanga Yoga? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, actually, to me, Hatha Yoga just means somebody that's doing yoga asanas. But, but mm-hmm. I, I understand what you mean. In the yoga community, Hatha Yoga relates to Shivananda Yoga, Integral Yoga. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Ernest, Ernest Wood's book was kind of a combination between... Uh, Iyengar and Shivananda, you know, he was kind of, and he had the asanas and things in there, but it wasn't one style or another. And so, uh, uh, yeah, when I first started, uh, uh, like the things that I learned from the Self-Realization Fellowship, that was more like Shivananda type style. And uh, Mm. then when I first taught my brother yoga, it was just, uh, I just was just teaching what I learned out of books, but most of that was what you would call not not Ashtanga. And then uh and then uh my brother got interested in surfing too, so we took another trip to Southern California. And then that's where we met uh I'm not really sure what the year was. It was the late Well you met well, didn't they they were told me you were making a surf film at the time, right? Well no that was a little later. Right. Uh, so oh, is we, it later, right? Yeah, we met, film, we yeah, met yeah. David Williams uh, teaching yoga in a karate studio, and he said, this is Ashtanga yoga. And we thought, we said, well, what's Ashtanga? And so he showed us. And so to me, it was just, it was harder than, more challenging than the other styles of yoga David and I had been doing. And so, uh, yeah, then in time, as you fast forward from that, I wrote a book on yoga. Well, I was back visiting my parents in Texas because I had moved to California, and uh, I was in a I was in an automobile accident, a head-on car collision, and I broke my femur. And uh, then, some time later, when I got out of the hospital, my dad said, "Well, they 
these people had insurance. So you got an insurance settlement of uh, $25,000. And back then, that was like $500,000 now or something. So so my parents said, oh, good, you can marry the girl next door and, and buy a little house. And I go, <laughs> are you crazy? <laughs> so I'm going to publish a book on yoga. And they go, oh, no, you're throwing your life away. <laughs> And so, uh, so I called it Yoga Helps because yoga helped me to recover from, uh, and I put my brother in the book, and, and then that's how, you know. Have you, have you got a copy of it? Are, are there still copies uh, around? I probably have one I could send you, but yeah. Oh, was, I'd love to. I'd love to look at it, just to look at it, or some, even some of the pictures, just send me some of them. Yeah. Be wonderful. Anyway, yeah, that was, and then, uh, and then David decided to uh, dedicate himself to Ashtanga yoga. I mean, much like you and a lot of other people. And uh, so you did. You didn't. You learned it from David Williams, but you didn't immediately take it up as a, as your practice. You kept on well, with the, what you've been doing. I mean, for about when Ashtanga yoga really caught on. I mean, when Patavi Joyce first came to the U.S., I was in the class then too but at the same time i would do ashtanga sometimes sometimes i would do the other stuff and then i dedicated myself just to ashtanga for about five years but did you right but then i missed doing other things you know i felt guilty if i would go to a bikram class or two or uh, but when you say you dedicated yourself to ashtanga was that were you learning with Tabi joyce with david as well together well i've only I had class with Batavi Joyce, you know, uh, like three or four times. In but uh, I was uh, practicing Ashtanga with David, and then uh, when David first got into it, uh, they had these just crumbly sheets of paper <laughs> that, that because there wasn't a book on Ashtanga, so they were just crumbly pieces of paper. And David Williams put little stick figures on there and. Uh, you know how everybody had their own thing, like Danny Paradise had a dragon with fire coming out of its mouth for the little stick figures. And so anyway, I just looked at the stick figures. And back then, it, was, it wasn't like, like now, I don't know, or right now, right now, but in time, like if you're going to learn Ashtanga, you know, you'd be doing first series for a year or two and second series for a year or two. And back then, I just had these crumbly sheets of paper and I'd been doing other yoga. So I just went through all the crumbly sheets of paper and I learned the whole, pretty much the whole series and I could do any posture. So I go into class and I could already do the asanas. I just follow the, the sequence. So you follow the, even, even the advanced series. How, how far did you get? Well, I could just do every pose because basically what I found out was that every pose in the Ashtanga series, it used to be first, second, third, and fourth. And then third and fourth got split into two, so then there were six. But all the poses are the same as in uh, Iyengar's book, only Iyengar doesn't use vinyasas. And so if I had a question about a pose, I'd go to Iyengar book and look and see how to do the pose, and then I'd come back to the other. So then when I'd go to a Sean class, I would just do as I was told. And, and I wouldn't question anything, and just to be respectful. And uh, But... Uh, so in time, when I got a little bit older, uh, uh, I would do Ashtanga yoga three days a week, and I'd do Shivananda or Integral or something softer two days a week. But because of that, I uh, progressed a little quicker because I was practicing poses that I wasn't really, uh, well, I wasn't approved by somebody to go do this pose in Ashtanga yoga, but I could do it in soft form yoga. And I, I found that, uh, like, just if we talked about yoga asana practice as just fitness, fitness, uh, a good plan is to have challenging days, have easy days, yeah. and then to have a rest mm. day, and to mm. cross train, cross train a little now and then. So, so even when I was dedicated to Ashtanga, occasionally I'd go out to a Bikram class just to see what that was like, and uh, and then there was always, eventually there. Would, became all these offshoots from Ashtanga. Like the first one was uh, Larry Schultz, who came yeah, out. Yeah, Rocket Yoga. And you did, and you checked, you did all them as well. You checked them all out. 
Yeah, yeah, I went to Rocket <laughs> Yoga, and I did Rocket One, and then there was a Rocket Two later. And I remember the first time I went to Larry's <laughs> studio, I went in, and he goes, "Oh, Doug, Doug, come on in here. You can sit right next to this guy." And then a uh, this guy was like an ex circus performer. Some you know, he's just one hand handstands and so, but, but yeah, so like I've been. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, you did, I mean, you had an, I mean, I've seen some of your postures and you have a similar aptitude as David, right? I mean, you know, a great ability in the asanas. Was that just, uh, both of you, just, just just come naturally or were you doing, no. did you grow up very physical? Well. Or did you practice, did you practice a lot? Did you practice for hours a day? How did the early years of your yoga go? I you know? practiced a lot. Well, when I first started doing yoga, all of a sudden, well, you know, I, I'm sure you know when you first started doing yoga, the main thing was I felt different. You know, like I wasn't stressed out or, you know, when I was living at home or something and I got more, uh, my mind opened up, I guess is what I say. So, uh, so, uh, yeah. And then when, uh, uh, when things first came in, uh, I would do yoga for, for different reasons, but I was still, and I always, almost always practice outside because I had lived in a mild climate and. It made me more. Res- I noticed that like little animals would come around and feel comfortable around. You know, like you, if you have a pet dog or something, they come and sit on your mat because they feel like energy. So uh, then, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got I lost the train. What was your question again? <laughs> no, at all. I was, uh, I was just thinking. I mean, did you come to yoga from other disciplines? Were you doing? I mean, because oh, you're doing oh, okay. the surf. You're doing the you're doing the surfing, right? And you you obviously. Yeah, you, you had a natural. Yeah, you had a yeah, you had a natural ability, both of you. You know, and uh, and I, I suppose it was twofold. First of all, had you been doing a lot of stuff beforehand, and second of all, did you just spend all your day, like at the time, uh, practicing yoga, and uh, and how did you how, and, and and how did you earn money then? Uh yeah. Uh, so I worked construction for money. You know, I would do construction jobs and things. But yeah, the yoga. I just thought you're supposed to do. You know. Two and a half, three hours every day. That's what I thought you were supposed to do. So, but, uh, but sort of like a shang is basically a big routine cut into six parts, you know, like this first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So, uh, but, uh, like first is mostly four bends, second, mostly back bends. And, and so I would just put them together and then I would do some from first, some from second, some from third, some from fourth. So it was just like taking a, a big routine and condensing it, and then I would relate that to other. So I think, well, Shivananda, Integral, Iyengar, they all have a beginning and an end, and then there's chapters like forward bends, backward bends, spinal twist, arm balance, uh, pranayama, and so then I would kind of, uh, and you know how it is with the shang, it's very challenging. So yeah, and into your question, I would do three hours. I would just do a three-hour practice. I thought that was kind of normal, and I'd just do that every day. And so then uh, the first time I started teaching yoga, it was in a community college, a continuing education class. And so I just took everybody through everything I did every day, and they all got sick and complained and never came back again because it was too hard. And so I go, oh, I guess everybody's not supposed to do this. But, yeah, I, I had always done – other things you know i was always kind of active like riding yeah, bike yeah. and things like that and then as i got older like you mentioned i started surfing but i noticed uh if i did yoga before i went surfing like if a big 50 foot wave is going to crash on me i'd go oh it's just water this is fun you know other people are like ah and so uh, and then my i had good balance and so i was a sponsored surfer by ocean pacific how were you Really? Yeah, and uh, so I was surfing professionally. And I was the only one that did yoga, you know. Like, hmm. and then later, you know, a lot of those other guys. First person I met that did yoga was Jerry Lopez from Hawaii, and then, but I'm sure all those guys do some yoga now. But yeah, and when you were kind of like 17, 18, you you moved to Southern California, right? Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Instead, well, actually, so you, I left home because you were seventeen. Yeah. yeah. As I was going to say, like, how did it work out at home? Because obviously you were, you were introduced to yoga by your parents in a way, right? But I don't imagine they were really pleased with your trajectory, yeah. you know, taking off. Right? Yeah. Right? And, fr- and all your friends as well. I mean, it must have been strange to, 
to be you doing yoga like this, you know, in that with that background. Well, when you get to California, when you get to California, it's a bit different. But how did it go down with your relationship with back home? Well, yeah, people didn't understand it, and uh, I didn't tell anybody I did yoga. Very rarely, I just I was kind of like a recluse. I'd do yoga by myself, and uh, in high school, uh, I had been doing yoga. But if I mentioned it, you know, somebody just just give me a hard time and so I learned uh, at a very young age you know to like as I'm talking to you if I didn't know you I'd get in your head and look back at me and go oh he thinks I'm this because I said that so I shouldn't say this and uh, I was raised in Texas and people are more uh, reactive there you know like if you say yoga then they go let's see yoga communism cultists <laughs> danger danger yeah and so it's a you know, and then, like you said in california everybody's a, a yoga teacher and a, a masseuse and an actor and actress and a surfer and so it's like it's just kind of the norm but how long do you how do you stay there i mean where, where, where have you lived oh. most of your life because you're back at home now right you're back you're back in texas now again right well sort of and sort of not what happened was a uh, uh, you know, I was an international yoga workshop teacher for four decades. And uh, then the COVID, the last job I taught was about a year and a half ago in Leon, Spain. And then they shut down the whole country and all my yoga jobs and disappeared. And so so uh, what happened was uh, they said, OK, you have to shelter at home. And I go, well, I don't have a home because I've just been living on the road and teaching yoga. And David, uh, my brother, lived in Austin. And so uh, right now I'm about 30 miles from Austin. I I didn't have any more income from the yoga, but I had saved uh, quite a, some money. And so uh, I bought a piece of property and I was going to renovate it and uh, then, then flip it and then go back to California. But uh, I was, <laughs> I mean, the same with yoga or anything else. I was think, oh, I can do all this. So I'll just do it myself. And so I bought some um, couple acres with a rundown house on it. I thought I'd flip it three months and it's been like a year and two months and I'm going, oh crap, what am I doing? And so are now... You, are you building it yourself? You're, you're doing yeah, it yourself, are you? Yeah, I, right. I hire some people to help me now and then and occasionally I'll pop into somebody's yoga class or teach somebody yoga, but I've only taught one yoga class since then. I taught in... It's funny, I taught in... I had a gig in St. Lucia just about six months after everything was closed. And they said, okay, come on. And then I found out that island had more COVID than COVID than any place. Right. And so when you get to the airport, you're isolated in this car. And you can't get out of the car until you get to the resort. Yeah. And then they check you twice a day for COVID and your yeah, temperature. Yeah, yeah. And, stuff like that. and yeah. people say, well, uh, why don't you give us your adjustments? And I go, well, I don't know that the, the administration doesn't want me to get close to people and stuff. So, so anyway, yeah, I, but basically in answer to your question, I'm still a resident of Southern California and I plan to go. Okay. I, and you said, Different what planet. did I do when I got there? I worked at, uh, I told you I was a sponsored surfer. So they said, well, we yeah. didn't give you a job. So I made surfboard wax and worked behind the counter in a surf shop. And then later okay. I would do construction. And then I just, uh, rent a house and get roommates and you know like a surfer crash pad or something and then right and then eventually it, it got too uh, busy for me in Encinitas so I moved up to uh, Santa Cruz California and then from Santa Cruz I moved up to Lake Tahoe but but uh so yeah I know you've been teaching in Lake Tahoe people have told me that they've been <laughs> to you in, but, in uh, doing retreats in Lake Tahoe not only yeah. did yoga help me with surfing but but I re I'm sure you know this too but it's like if you're supposed to, if you're in college and you're studying something, whatever it is, and you have to read a book that's not really of interest to you, if I did yoga first, I found that I could absorb stuff, more uh, information, and I could, you know, it, it's, it organizes your brain, it opens it up, opens it up to where, uh, and then even in a conversation with, with somebody, uh, and you know, because you've traveled a lot too, as a, the first time I ever, went anywhere out of the u.s was mexico and i went oh my god you know this is different 
you know, people hang their clothes out to dry and they don't have dryers and little kids just have fun without <laughs> did any you, money. Did you, ever, did you ever go to India? Did, did yeah. you ever go? Yeah. Yes, I mean, not, to, not to Batavi Joyce. Uh, no, not to Batavi Joyce. But uh, actually, you know, uh, A.G. Mohan? Uh, okay, well, he was one of the people that studied Krishnamachara. Anyway, so, um, so on and so forth. I've studied with Batavi Joyce, but not in India. And so, uh, uh, in the meantime, I had a lot of other other interests, and uh, that's when things, like when I first started doing yoga, there was just yoga or no yoga. And then the first <laughs> style, I yoga, did, and, yoga and no yoga. Yeah, because you say, uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty. Well, yeah. because Ernest Wood just called his yoga, yoga, yoga. Yeah, Ernest yeah, Wood, yeah. yoga. If you don't do, if you don't then, yoga, then you're not, and yeah, then then you're I not met doing it. Somebody that did uh, Iyengar yoga. And I said, well, how's it different than yoga? And they told me, and I said, oh, okay, they're using props and stuff. And then there was a Shivanandan integral. And they're re- fairly similar in some ways because they're soft, but they have different order of routine. And when the shaman came in, I thought, oh, well, that's the hard yoga. You know, I just rationalized things simply. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And so yeah. then it got to the point where uh, uh, I think we all used to be tribal, you know, so he, he, if you don't join a group, you know, you don't get the support of the group or something. So so then, I like, I think some of the things you've written on your uh, Facebook page mm-hmm. and stuff is mm-hmm. that so people are are kind of in, in the style, in the yoga system, you remember that saying, well, if you dig a hole here and you dig a hole here and you dig a hole there, mm-hmm. you're never going to reach water. You should just stick to one. Mm-hmm. And then I'd say, well, but if it rains, I'll have six holes of water and you only have one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so I, I intentionally studied different styles yeah, of yoga yeah. just to see. And then, uh, like I said, I did just Ashtanga for like five years, but then. But also, when I've seen you practicing, it looks like, you know, yeah. it looks kind of Ashtanga based, right? Yeah. I mean, I've, yeah. I still teach Ashtanga sometimes. I yeah. Mean, I have yeah. the knowledge of it and I can do it. Well, but I, I be, for but, people uh, trying to get a grip of your, of your approach to yoga, what. What would you say defines your style of approach to asana? If people wanted to come to a workshop, you know, with you, you know, uh-huh. and be taught by you, you know, how would you, how would you say that you teach? You know, what's your approach to, to the yoga asanas? Well, yeah. I, oh, just the asana part or yoga in general? Well, start with the asana part, mate. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yoga asanas are, are basically uh, uh, the shortest route to, <laughs> I mean, there's the physical, the mental and the spiritual. Basically, and the, the asana is the physical part, but uh, you really need physical, mental, and spiritual to make it complete. But uh, like, if Ashtanga was uh, my system, uh, what I would do is just inter- show people how to breathe the first day, and then maybe give them one pose, and then you know teach them about relaxation and another pose. But when we first did uh, Ashtanga with David Williams. We just did a whole first series the first day, you know, and you just get so on. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think you would have just stuck it if someone had said, well, you can do one pose and just breathe. I don't <laughs> think that would have attracted you. Right? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I nowadays, like if I'm teaching a Shtanga class, I go, well, this is traditional, but this is how I do that. Like, for example, uh, uh, and I, I know, you, I think you've mentioned this before too, like uh, each and people didn't like to talk to this about this before, but I don't mind talking about it now. Each system of yoga has its own uh, different injuries. Like uh, <laughs> Shivananda Integral Yoga, it's like overstretching the knees and things like that. And Iyengar maybe <laughs> part of the back. Ashtanga was wrist, elbows, and shoulders. You know, from the the, the vinyasas. Mm-hmm. And so, and and I learned in time that if I just did Ashtanga and never took days off. It was a little bit hard on the wrist. So, uh, but I learned from these things by getting injuries. Like the first thing to me was was the injuries to the wrist. Uh, before that, I had hurt my back in Iyengar yoga. And before that, you know, I had messed up my knees from sitting in <laughs> lotus too much in, in uh, Shivananda. In Shivananda. Yeah. And so I would, so with the Shivananda thing, I didn't do yoga. For a week or two, and I started hiking up hills and riding a bike, and all of a sudden my knees felt better. And I thought, well, why didn't the yoga teacher tell me this? You know, 
And so it's kind of like, you know that saying, you get blinded by the light? You're so much mm. in love, or you, maybe you fell in love and you, your, your wife or your girlfriend or something. You're so in love that everybody else can see problems in there, but you can't see it. You're so in love with what you're doing, and it feels so good. And so it was the same with yoga. I overcame knee injuries by injuring my knees in Shivananda yoga, and I overcame my back issues by doing more abdominal work and uh, you know being a little more mindful about how I went to poses and that there's different body types and everybody can't do everything. And then uh, with Ashtanga yoga, with the wrist, uh, I started doing more. Uh, I talked to somebody in the fitness community, and they said, well, if you're doing a bench press, you know, pushing like that, you should also mm. pull back this way. So a bench press is Chaturanga Dhanasana, is the Vinyasa. So we're always pushing that way, and we're never pulling back this way. So I started pulling back this way, and I started intentionally doing wrist exercises that were uh, so you've always up. supplemented your practice yeah, with, other, so, with other things, have you? Yeah, so instead of just listening to uh, Tommy Joyce or, or my brother Dave Woods or somebody else, I would say, well, you have this body type, I have that body type, and this is hurting my wrist. And, and I, I mean, I know a lot of people in all the different styles of yoga who they would just do every pose, keep doing it, even if their body hurt, and they just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, and then and then they just quit all together and not do mm. yoga at all. But I still do yoga every day and, and I don't have <laughs> and, any and, and you maintained it from that time. Of, yeah, because of... I can I can tell when I'm, uh, you, you know, if I'm going to injure myself. I go, okay, I shouldn't do that for a while. And if I did, like when I moved to Lake Tahoe, uh, there's mountains and, and I love hiking and stuff. So, so uh, some days... I wouldn't do yoga for a few days. I'd just go hiking. And then I'd be all stiff and I'd come back to yoga and it would feel really good. But I got beyond that point where, well, if I'm in a yoga class and I can't get my feet to my head and Guruji uh, Krasna, uh, then, then people will think lowly of me or something. <laughs> Did you ever think that? I don't imagine you ever would have thought that. <laughs> yeah. And so later on, I thought, well, I don't care what they think. I don't. I don't want to do yoga today, or I don't care if I do. like, uh, you know, in like in my store and uh, class with the Tavi Joshi in India, if someone gets their head all the way back to their butt, they say, "Well, why not further?" You know, so it's like, so I mean, after after a while, I mean, I thought, well, if I can do more impressive asanas than anyone else, is that going to make me smarter or more intelligent or? Or what's it going to do? Or, or that, that saying, the middle line is the path to enlightenment. Mm. So, uh, so I backed off a little bit. On, like I used to, at the, at the point where I could do almost every asana without a problem, if I went to someone else's class, I'd hold back. And I wouldn't show them what I had. Because I just wanted to see how they taught. And I didn't want to give them all that. So I just act like, oh, I can't touch my toes. How should I do this? But then I'd listen to people telling me how. And and then I've had some really bad injuries in my life from a, like automobile accidents and things. And and so I learned how to use yoga to re recover. From it. I mean, it's funny. You're, you're starting to so different to David, who, as far as I know, has always been straight down the line Ashtanga, right? Did well, you ever he, have a... I taught him yoga first, but then, yeah, ever since then, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Certain people are... Did, did you have a discrepancy? Did you, or did you talk about it and, and argue the toss? Yeah. Did you well, debate it? Because you know? I mean, one thing that you don't have is, is the, uh, the vinyasa part of it, right? Like people in the Ashtanga world would claim that the vinyasa, that counting, that repetition, that structuring of the breath to the posture yeah. is important. I mean, yeah. Well, no, I... I've, I'll, that's what's interesting because I practiced yoga outside when I first learned for, and I used to watch my shadows on the ground. So when I move, there is a vinyasa. There's a definite flow between every pose before I even saw Ashtanga yoga. And uh, people go, are you doing Tai Chi? And I go, I'm just doing yoga. But every time I get from one pose to the next, I had a definite flow to get there. But mine was soft. So that's like soft vinyasa. And then Ashtanga was the more physical vinyasa. But there's times when that's what's, now I'm going to tell you something that's totally forbidden in yoga. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so some days uh, when I was living in Tahoe, I would always do, almost always do yoga, but I'd be doing a, like a softer style of yoga and I go, but you know, I want to get a little more cardio. So I'll put the Ashtanga vinyasas. Here. So I'd put Ashtanga vinyasas and Chivananda yoga. It was so hard. And then a few days later, I'm doing Ashtanga and I'm going, well, I'm a little tired from hiking. I just won't do the vinyasas in Ashtanga today. And I mean, that's totally forbidden. You can't do that. But then I learned about, uh, you know, like a vinyasa basically is just a connecting link between uh, two places. And a, and like you said, the, the meter of the breath or something. But then again, like, uh, like for me to take a deep breath, if they said, hold this posture for three breaths, that might take me 15 minutes or something because I had a really long, uh, I had a lot of cardio from hiking and, and mm. uh, from years of yoga. And so, yep. so have you done pranayama as well? Do you do, you do yeah, the pranayamas? Yeah, yeah. I did a lot. Of, I still do. You've gone to a lot of different teachers, but did you ever have one specific person who inspired you or, or you could have said it was your teacher? No, that's, that's a really good, really good question. Uh, well, first, it was Ernest Wood, but then he passed away, and so then mm. I, then my teacher was just Mother Nature or something. But but yeah, mm. I, I for some reason it's I think it's my personality or something. But uh, uh, I would go to one teacher for a while, but I didn't want to say. I mean, and I know in yoga they say when the student's ready, the teacher will appear or something like that. But then, but then, I think part of it is kind of marketing, like. Uh, you know, when Iyengar first came to the U.S. and opened a studio, and everybody around that area only does it, uh, Iyengar yoga. They would never do anything else. And then the same when, like, uh, Patabi Joyce came to the U.S. So people tend to, and, I mean, in some ways, and without any disrespect to yoga, I feel like I was kind of like Bruce Lee. You know, he, in the, the martial art community, he studied different styles but then he kind of mixed and matched and tried to improve on what he was doing so but i respect the styles and if you don't have if ashtanga didn't have structure if you didn't do vinyasas then you're not doing ashtanga and if you change the order of poses then you're not doing ashtanga but but that's kind of how a, like from ashtanga well from ashtanga came power yoga and from power yoga came vinyasa like power yoga was three people: Beryl Bender, Brian Kess, and Baron Baptiste. And they all the bees in there, yeah. but they all did it different. And then Beryl caught so much crap. You know, when she came out with the book, she called it power yoga, but it was first level of stronger. You know, and so, so it's kind of yeah. Like, I interviewed I, I interviewed then, Brian. Uh, he said that actually Beryl Beryl issued a cease and desist originally <laughs> with Brian, and uh, yeah, because and of the then, power yoga. Uh, but what I was going to say, like what. What would you say if you were, because you're very open and, and very thoughtful and pragmatic about your approach well, to yoga. I call I call what I do, I put a name to what I do, but it, it doesn't, okay. it's kind of like a, what well, it's called a sadhana yoga chi. Sada means practice quest or act of mastery. Yeah. Uh, yoga is union and chi is energy. So my philosophy was, uh, so like Groundhog Day, which you couldn't do yesterday, try to improve on it tomorrow or something and uh and then but i i have a structure you know because i do uh there's a beginning and an end and i do each category of asana some days uh, do you teach that same structure when you teach do you teach I people the same way or do you, or do you modify it person to person and do you, and you don't seem to be much of a pusher really i can imagine you, you, your style seems to be structured on quite soft like kind of a soft very soft approach well, it's just like we're talking about Ashtanga. Uh, let's go back to Ashtanga for a minute. So, uh, like the asanas in first level Ashtanga. If you learn the asanas first and don't do vinyasas, and then you start weaving a few vinyasas in, uh, then I think you don't. You're not struggling with the asana and the vinyasa at the same time. Like if you take that, if you take the the vinyasa part, you've got upward dog, downward dog, and a warrior in there, and and you know some chaturanga in the asana. So, so those are asanas. But uh, so what I saw happening in time. I mean, in the in the softer styles, you'd see people doing things that's going to be injurious to their knees and uh, their back or something. But they're not paying attention. But they're just so involved that I've got to do this because it's in the routine. And then in the shanga, 
uh, you know, like I said, there's other issues, but if you take something apart, like just the sun salutation, Sudhi Namaskar B, there's about six different asanas in there. And so I don't think it hurts every now and then not to do vinyasas, just to focus on the asana. And then when you put it together, it all flows really nice. I mean, I got where I could do a shanga is good or, or better than anyone else and sticking to the rules. But I didn't want to do that every day. I kind of missed doing other things. And then I and then I, I noticed that it helped me with other areas, too. So uh, mm, mm. and then uh, like even if we go back as far as we know anyway, I mean, you know, the the theoretical crumbly banana leaves that Ashtang was written on mm. or something. So in the early years of Preach Machada, you know, Iyengar studied, uh, uh, A.G. Mohan and uh, Dobby Joyce and Andrew Dev and, you know, uh, anyway, Ramanand Patel. So all of these people were in the same class with Krishna Machara, but they all went out and did something completely different. Like the I, Mr. There's pictures of Mr. Iyengar doing a shang and doing the vinyasas, but then he he didn't do it. He didn't do that anymore. And and so then, did you ever did you ever, did you ever miss the sense of community? Because obviously the, the Ashtanga community and you're friends with a lot. Of, you know, I think you're friends with Danny, aren't you? And you know, yeah. and other people in the well, yeah, Ashtanga community. Other, Danny and John, yeah. they've all done it. True. My brother yeah. does other stuff too. He just doesn't advertise yeah. it because <laughs> he can't leave his following. <laughs> I mean, you've done yoga with me. We just goof around yeah. when we meet and we do some yoga and stuff. Do you? Would you actually yeah. meet up? Do you, pra- do you practice together? Well, it's funny because we've done so much yoga. Like, we'll go to a park and be riding bikes and doing a few poses, and then we'll watch some people doing yoga. And then we just, but, you know, uh, yeah, we we used to practice together all the time. and uh, But now, like, he's married and he's got his life. and. And I do yeah. my thing, and but but yeah, actually, that's kind of interesting. But now you're close by, you meet up and get him around to help build the house. Yeah, that's the most hammer, hammer a few nails in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah come on, David, the, get the hammer. The most I've yeah. visited him with him in years because usually we only see each other you know, like one week out of the year or something like that. But, but uh, then although you I mean, your personality seems quite different. You, you, I, I've always oh, thought yeah, you get yeah, on, yeah, you're quite close, you get on quite well, don't you? Because, yeah, we get along great. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have differences of opinion on things. Uh, we used to teach yoga together, but what would happen is, that, uh, yeah, we we do a workshop that we'd be we'd be both be teaching. But but what would happen is, uh, uh, David's following would say, "Well, Doug does other stuff too, and that's going to kind of pollute. That's going to dilute what I want." Police. And then my yeah. people, and then my people would go, "Oh, I've heard of Shanga. That's going to kill me. I'm not going to do that." And so. Usually by herself, we'd each have a full class, and then together, we would get deluded because half of no one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they leave, go, well, so. I don't even know what this is. It might be a bad omen or something. But, but and then, I mean, I think what David always felt that Patavi Joyce was something more than just an asana teacher, right? You never had the oh, feeling yeah. of guru, guru yeah. or, or the want of a, you know, the kind of spiritual guru around yeah. the asana. Because we've yeah. talked about asana a bit, you know, and, and how does asana relate to something more? And uh, yeah. yeah, and and that did you ever miss that relationship with someone who you felt would be maybe more than just a you know just well, a teacher of gymnastics kind of thing? See, that's like being caught between a rock and a hard spot. Once you say mm. this is my guru and I'm going to dedicate myself to this person, mm. then mm. then you almost get to me you get uh, narrow in a little way because if someone else has something else to offer, like when I first learned about how to get rid of injuries to the wrist. Uh, it wasn't from a yoga teacher. It was from a fitness teacher. And mm. so, so I thought, oh, well, you know. And, like, I, I've learned a lot from the different styles of yoga. And, like, Mr. Bikram, when he heated the room, you know, basically that's just trying to replicate my sword because it's hot and sweaty, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, is then, it, where was he from? Kind of Calcutta or somewhere, wasn't he? Or could say Madras, sorry. I yeah, Calcutta. and then he, he yeah, won the Madras, yoga Olympics. Did you, did you practice? Were you doing Bikram with Bikram himself or, or one of his no, teachers? No, no, one of his right, okay. the teachers. Right, but, okay, okay. But I mean, yeah, I, I, okay. you know, to answer your question, no, I never dedicated myself to one person. In that, and yeah. David and I are different in that respect. Like, I think personally, people should uh, dedicate themselves to uh, one style of yoga that they 
feel it resonates to them. But I also think that once every couple months, they should go off and try something from Shivananda or try something from Iyengar, try something Bikram, just to see what's there and then come back to your base style. It's kind of like... But uh, do you have a, do you have a, it seems like you have lots of different styles, like you're doing different things each day, you know? Or well, do you have a, like a base, a base style? I have base. It's just, I just, it's how I feel that day, what I want to do. It's kind of like a, uh, to me, I think of it just as like yoga in general. It doesn't matter where you're doing a shtanga injury or anything you're doing. If you go out and hike and ride bikes and you're really sore, if you, or even if you work construction and you don't do yoga, you're going to be really messed up. So yoga is like physical. Physical, mental, and spiritual maintenance. It's like clean the slate, start all over again, you feel good. Like, uh, even with the shtanga, even though it's challenging, you know, we can get where we can do that and still feel fine. But uh, but if you don't, like, when I tried to just do yoga, nothing else, four years. And right. I had more injuries then than when I'm... I really... Because, because if you go hike, it strengthens your knees a little bit more, and then it doesn't bother you so much sitting in lotus. And uh, and then surfing, you have to hold your breath a long time. So that's like pranayama, and the, just the balance of it. And so, like one helped the other. And so, uh, so that's kind of how I've yeah. And that's how I was different than David. David's more of a a patriot of something. And and like you said, uh, uh like Tabi Joseph be his guru. I really respected the Tabi Joseph, but but then I was also curious about. I mean, just in life, like I could learn a lot of things from you, but I wouldn't want to say, well, I'm just going to learn what right. Adam mm. tells me and not listen <laughs> to my brother anymore, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, you've done yoga since, I mean, like it, literally almost since its, it's uh, origination in, in the, since, I mean, a long time. bloody time anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and now it's a, it's, a, it's a business, it's an industry, it's an industry, it's a whole, it's a whole scene. I was going to ask you, what, can can I you interrupt you? Yeah. Can I interrupt so, you? Yeah, yeah. so back when I went to India, I went to study with A.G. Mohan, but I kept emailing him and his wife said, well, we're not teaching yoga anymore. And uh, so I'd go other places in India. And then and then finally his wife said, well, OK, come and maybe, you know, my husband will talk to you and we can do talk. And so then finally I get close to where they live and she said okay he said to come on by so it was their house and i go to their house and she enters the door and then i was traveling with a, a, a girl that was from russia and uh so she's all excited and to meet you know a real bona fide guru and so then aj mohan comes out and he goes uh have you read my books and uh practiced my type of yoga and i go no and he goes, so why are you here? And I said, somebody told me you had an open mind and I thought it was worth the trip. And he goes, ah, come on in. I like you. You know, we sat and talked. And then my friend was, she couldn't speak because she was, you know, so uh, there's this guru guy. She's like, <clears throat> and he goes, well, maybe the girl should go talk and we can talk. And I go, okay. So anyway, I talked to him for like three or four hours about all kinds of stuff and how it was with Krishna Chatter and and then he was, uh, he's kind of merged his stuff with like the Ayurvedic philosophy and that kind of thing. But anyway, so back to what. Yeah, no, I met him. I mean, he came over to, to London a number of years ago. What, was, what did he say about Krishna? What was he saying about Krishnamacharya? Anything interesting? Do you remember? Well, he just said that he didn't teach just one way. He would diversify. Like he might teach you different than he taught me sometimes. And because you see the people that came out of there. Uh, that kind of did yeah, different things. Yeah. Like it wasn't just this all the time. And I mean, back then, like seven people in the class was a full class or something, you know. And these people were all, you know, uh, and uh, yeah. But he said he, uh, that he really enjoyed seeing it. And oh, he told me one funny thing. He said that uh, some famous Swami came into the class there once. Uh, and he came with an entourage of, of uh, beautiful women or something. And uh, so right. one day, Krishna Chara said to A.G. Mohan, he goes, uh, uh, I thought this guy was a Swami. 
And he goes, yeah, he is. And he goes, but there's all these women. And he goes, oh, well, he's from the U.S. And he goes, oh. <laughs> anyway. I think people said the same thing about Lino Mieli uh, at points. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, he's, Ita- he's Italian. What, you know? yeah. it's, that's, that's the way they are. Um, what, what about the yoga industry then? That's what I was going to say. Is like you've seen, you know, you see huge changes. Before it was an industry, it was just literally you, David, and a few people practicing. And now it's a huge billion dollar industry. You know, what do you think of how yoga has become? And what, what would you like to see changed in it? If that's not too open a question, is there anything that you would love to see changed or, or you like the way it's going or any comments <laughs> on that? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. first of all, uh, I mean, I think it's good that a lot of people started doing because people, like I said, when I started practicing yoga, it was uh, forbidden or something, even in the U.S. And But because of all the issues in the world, you know, I thought it was great when more people did yoga. But yeah, anything that gets really popular gets diluted. Now there's yoga booty ballet or iron yoga, you know, yoga with weights or yoga kata, yoga with martial arts. And, and so it gets diluted in a way but at least i thought well at least people are are mindful of some things at least they're doing a little yoga you know and uh but but no it's not up to me to yoga is supposed to be about awareness you know and so but the funny thing is that's where if we come back to being a patriot if you get awareness from yoga and then you just get in this tunnel where you're not going to consider anything else then then you're not aware anymore you know because you've got in this little box and uh so uh i think it's great that a lot of people are doing yoga but it does get diluted and then like if if i just started doing yoga now i'd be very confused there's so many different styles of yoga and everybody's saying well you should do this this is better than that you should do that and there was a time when like an iyengar person wouldn't sit down and have lunch with an ashtanga person because they had a different point of view or something and then uh but but yeah, I think it's good that yoga got more popular, but I also think that a lot of people, like I had a, uh, a girl come into my teacher's training once and she said, well, I already know everything, but I'm just coming here to get a certificate. And I, I, I said, well, what, um, who did you study yoga with you? And she said, oh, well, I learned all of yoga in six months from a, somebody or something and i go oh well, that's very nice <laughs> but she couldn't do any of the asanas very well and she didn't know much about the background she goes i don't want to know anything i don't want to know anything i already know it all and i just want to come and get a student and i mm-hmm. go okay go up in front of the class and teach something and she goes well, i, guess well, that's I don't different. want to do that and i go well you <laughs> want to be able to teach you but you don't want to teach <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a problem student. Um, I suppose I suppose it's good to say is that there's one difference be- between you know when you started now is that it's become something which you can definitely do as a career is for money, right? Whereas when you started, yeah. it was like your parents thought this is it, you know, he's just yeah. blown his life, right? He's not going to make any money off yeah. that. You can't support yourself off that, right? Yeah, and that kind of that kind of changes kind of changes the dynamic a bit and, and the way that you're practicing. Yeah, I mean, and also, a- I mean, surely. Surely it was less competitive back at the time when people weren't really thinking that they, if they competed enough, they could make a living. Do you know what I mean? Like it was just yeah. like, just looser and a bit more for fun, well, right? When the money, money wasn't so obviously involved. Or was the, it always involved from the early days? No, it wasn't. The first time, I didn't know anyone would pay you for teaching yoga. You know, I just had mis- And then uh, I saw that ad for teaching yoga, continuing education. And, and so I thought, why do people want to pay me for doing yoga? Why don't they just do it out of a book? You know, I don't understand. And so, so I went and taught, and then I learned in time that everybody can't do what I could do. And so I just modified things and I just tried to make people feel good and, and took, you know, a forward bend, a back bend, a spinal twist, some breathing, relaxing. And, and uh, some people, if you got, some people would leave class during Shavasana because they thought I would capture their mind and put some voodoo in or something. And so, uh, over, uh, I'm sorry, I jumped the fence again. What was the, what did you just ask me? 
Uh, I suppose the complications that money brings in because originally, oh, okay. you know, yeah. Like, yeah, you yeah, want, yeah. You know, yeah. Okay. So someone paid me a teacher and I thought, okay, and they were paying me something like a, uh, $15 an hour, but it was for three hours, three times a week or something. And so I thought, oh, that's nice. And then, yeah, later, uh, what had happened was uh, uh, yoga got more popular. And then somebody said, hey, if you'll come over here, my brother started doing the workshop for me. Someone told David, well, if you go over here, we'll pay you this much money. And uh, so it went from making $15 an hour. So then when workshops became popular, uh, you're making like $250 an hour kind of a so maybe more, you know, maybe $500 an hour. So you're thinking, oh, my God, this is like, but I never got, uh, uh, I mean, like you're talking about, like the whole world, like what's going on now in Russia and different things. Everything's about recognition, you know, like even Facebook. Look at all the likes I have. Look at me. You know, look what I did. I did this. This is me. And uh, so it's like a. Uh, uh, it's kind of about money, uh, power, recognition. And so, like you said, when that comes into yoga, it doesn't seem very yogi. But it's just I've even had people confront me and say, uh, you're disrespectful for teaching yoga for money. That's that's exploitation of something beautiful. And I go, well, how do you make a living? Well, I'm a doctor. And I go, well, uh, I'm a yoga teacher. You know, so it's like. So yeah, I, I wa- and I rationalize wa- things that way, and people would say, "Well, the best yoga teacher is the one that makes the most money." And I go, "Well, not always. They sometimes they're, <laughs> they're the biggest jerk." <laughs> so, so. <laughs> but it's never been your aim. I mean, you know, really, you've never been a yoga businessman, right? I mean, yeah, you know, that's- I'm not that. You know, my brother was more uh, driven. He, he's pretty, think, than, yeah, he's pretty me, astute yeah. on that on that front. Yeah, 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 because I've I've published like five books on yoga, but, you know, I wasn't, when, when I was making money in workshops, you know, I just, because I was, you know, I was booked all the time, you know, and making pretty good living. So, so when I wasn't teaching a yoga workshop, I'd teach yoga to people for free or, or something or do something else. But I wasn't like a, like I know a Bruce McKay from a union yoga in Scotland. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah, kind of marketed, yeah. he kind of branded Dino, like He's the one that kind of got her in the scene because he was good at branding and marketing. So he got her own mats and her own things. I didn't know that. Right. And like my brother. Bruce uh, was it. Yeah. And then my brother, uh, he was teaching yoga back in Texas. And there was a a man in his class. This was a Shanga yoga. And this before David was really popular. So the man said, this is great. You know, you should uh, do a. A video on this that was before you know dvds and all this stuff mm-hmm. so david goes well i don't have any money i can't do that he goes oh well, i would back you so then in the end the guy put endless backing into david and ran ads in yoga Journal, and all of a sudden david's really popular and uh so then uh, and i mean all these people that got popular like uh I know Brian Kess was kind of charismatic and taught in Hollywood and stuff like that. So that's kind of, everybody had their, yeah, yeah, yeah. their little jump into things. And, okay. uh, and the, I had opportunities to do things like that. Like people said, well, I want to back you and, and you'll do yeah. this. And I go, but yeah. then I have to be in this box. And, and it reminded <laughs> me of when I was, I was uh, doing yoga when I was a competitive surfer with Ocean Pacific. And I was doing the yoga contest circuit and uh then one day i was out surfing in a contest and you know i had stickers on my board because i was sponsored by this company and my coach would tell me what to do and how to win this contest and so i'm sitting out in the water and i saw a dolphin jumping in the wave and i just jumped off my board and started swimming with the dolphin and i i (laughs) i lost my uh round that time and my coach is going what are you doing? You had that one. All you had to do is do this. And I go, well, that's just what I was thinking. Because I'm kind of like a yoga guy that's out surfing. And I don't want to have to do this. I just want to go sit under a tree and do yoga. And he goes, what? 
you're going to throw away this whole thing? And I go, I don't want to wear badges. I don't want to be sponsored by anybody anymore. So then I went to Central America and uh, Costa Rica, and I lived on the beach, and I'd do yoga every day and go surfing. And I was really happy. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Wow. What's your, so what's your aim? What's, your, what was, what's been your aim at yoga or your aim at life? Could you, I mean, just to round off the interview, could you uh, say what you're, you're, what you're aiming at? Yeah. Well, it's a awareness. A question. It's like, uh, awareness. Right? Yeah. I mean, awareness of what? Well, to see the of, world. Or why? Is, well, right. I just like to, if, if you can take yourself back from everything, it's like, what if all of life is, we know it, it's just a movie. So then you sometimes you get off the movie and you sit on the hill and you look back at all the people watching the movie and just kind mm. of, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like, I feel I have a lot of empathy for what's going on in Ukraine right now. And, and, and just the same as you, I have a lot of good friends from the Ukraine and from Russia and all over the world, you know. And so when I travel, I was kind of like an observer. I go through someone else's life and just watch what they're doing, and then I come out and do something else. But uh, uh, as far as yoga is concerned, uh, I think yoga is a way to to find yourself and to uh, to gain respect and to just look back at things and be an um, an observer uh, sometimes. And uh, so for me, like right now, mm. uh, I'm. I feel like I got stuck in now I'm like a carpenter. <laughs> but I want to be a surfer and doing yoga and, and like college. But I think I, I don't know. I think I see there's a kind of fluidity of the way you live your life, which must be must be very relaxing. But it, it is. But, and at the same time it's like I do most of this work myself right now, but but I'll be building something and then a butterfly will land on my hand or something. And I'll go <laughs> I'll can't. go, Oh yeah, I understand. <laughs> I'll put the hammer down and then I'll go sit down in the yeah, I can do some yoga with the butterfly or something. And uh, one really quick thing. So I noticed that yoga gives you that energy where it attracts nature and animals and things. And so uh, when I was in Texas, you know, there's a squirrel or a bird or something. And then when I moved to Lake Tahoe, I I always like to be a, a recluse a lot with my yoga. So I was way out in the mountains doing yoga by a waterfall. And I'm in the middle of my practice. And a little bear cub comes up and goes, ow! And I go, oh, hi. And I go, where's your mom? She goes, hey, mom, come over here. And I go, no, no, no. Mom, come here. Cut this guy out. And I go, no, 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 no. And so I start trying to move away. And the little cub and the bear are following me. And I'm going all the way back to my house. And then my roommates go, there's a bear in the yard. And I go, I'm sorry. And they go, what does that have to do with you? And I go, well, you wouldn't understand. But I, I found out that in time, that, and then later on when I got used to that, I'd go out behind my house in the mountains and do yoga. And then I see a bear over there and a coyote over here. And they just look at me and watch and do their thing. And then my friend would be jogging through the meadow and they would run away and leave. And he'd wave to me. And then he's gone and they'd come back. And I thought, well, that's nice. Now I'm just like a bear, a coyote, done doing yoga, a tree. I'm just part of the community <laughs> instead of something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the one more thing I'll mention and then I'll end it up. So we were, yeah. I had a group. Doing teacher training, we were sitting in a circle doing pranayama outside, and there was a bear coming down a tree. And they said, Oh, there's a bear. I go, Don't worry, he's afraid of you. But then the bear just came up and just sat and watched us for a while. And I thought, Well, as long as nobody screams and starts running, this is okay. So it was kind of like the, the energy of yoga can touch everybody in a positive way. Like if you do yoga and you walk out of the studio, Somebody's less apt to punch you in the face or mouth off to you or something because they kind of feel like like Adam's kind of soothing. I can feel his energy. I want to be around this this calm or something, you know. So, so I think if we all can uh, see the world through the eyes of someone else, you know. Well, and then like there, I have a saying that uh, humans should listen to their thoughts in the way clouds should listen to the wind. So, <laughs> so what that means is that, like, if clouds listen to the wind, they know where they're going. And so, if we don't uh, listen to our thoughts, your thoughts become action. Action becomes your life, and that becomes your moral. But in this day of uh, the downside of technology, is that we all have personal phones now, and it's like, and I'll ask people, I'll go, "What do you think about uh, 
you know, and they'll look it up on their iPhone. And I go, but no, I'm asking you personally, Adam, what do you think about yoga? And go, well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, and so it's like we've gotten to that point where someone else makes all Surrey tells us what to do or something. You know. But but in yoga, if we can just learn to just sit and look sometimes and just uh, listen rather than because there's so much noise. Doug, if everyone, um, if everyone looked at life through your eyes, the world would be at least a, a lot more of a peaceful place i would i would <laughs> more rather than you rather than other you looking through other people's eyes i'd like more people to look through your eyes uh, well oh, one, you know. one last one uh, last thing like yeah. uh, oh, every now and then you get confronted with somebody i remember uh somebody was beating me up or something they had some problem they thought i did something so they were pushing me up against the wall and they were like punching me and so i just started laughing oh, as an adult uh, yeah, yeah. It was like, uh, I, it was some little town in Central America or something. <laughs> I guess there was a bar or some guy and some junk guy right. came by and I said hello and then he just started punching me. And so I didn't take it personal. I just started laughing. And he goes, why are you laughing? And I said, well, because I don't want to be angry. <laughs> and then he just walked <laughs> away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Oh. Um, that's all. Okay, all right. Well, yeah. we'll leave you there. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Such a nice interview with you. Lovely to meet you at last. Um, well, nice to meet you. Thanks for your time, Doug. <laughs> <laughs>